Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue looking at the present truth application, uh, verses uh, 27 to 28. We already did 25 to 26. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence into our midst, and we ask, Lord, that this study can be a blessing to all who may see it, and that these studies that have been a blessing to us, that they can help others. And we know, Lord, there's much that we do not understand, and we just ask that uh, as we open your word together, that our minds can be enlightened and that our characters can be transformed. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sort of a, a side note on this study. I was doing a uh, a discussion on Facebook Messenger with uh, Guy James Prest. He is, he is extremely, there's some people that are difficult to communicate with, and he's one of them. And, and I'm always fascinated when there are people that are hard to communicate with, because one is, I seek everything I can do to try to figure out how to communicate to them. So we had a discussion on, so he asked me a question on Facebook. His question was, how is the answer uh, given in Daniel chapter eight? You know, we're going to look at this here quickly. The Daniel chapter eight, verse 14. How is that an answer to the question in verse 13? So, so we know there's the question. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily? And the sacrifice, the daily, wait, sacrifice should be left out, and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So, I mean, this is a pretty standard Adventist thing, and he's an Adventist. And he professes to believe in the 1260 and he doesn't believe the 2520. So when we look at this, this question, we know that the daily is uh, a period of 1260 years described in Daniel 12, verse seven, the time times and a half for the scattering of the power of the holy people. And we know that the transgression of desolation, also called the abomination of desolation, is um a period of 1260 years that ends in 1798. So what he was arguing is, is kind of odd. So what it says, and he said unto me unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. He says, inexplicably, I have no idea, but he says that since it's cleansed and it's past tense, that means that the answer must mean that the transgression of desolation continues until the sanctuary's cleansing is completed. Does that make any sense to anyone? Repeat that again. That one is weird. Yeah. So he's saying because it says that the sanctuary is going to be cleansed, and that's past tense. Now, he, 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 he believes the 2300 days ends in 1844. But it says, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And he says, well... The question is, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? So he argues then that the transgression of desolation must continue until the end of the cleansing of the sanctuary, not some period by the, at the beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And, and he focuses upon cleansed. He says cleansed. So when the sanctuary is cleansed, that refers to the whole period. And so he says that the transgression of desolation, the papal power, continues all the way until the close of probation. Does, does that make any sense to anyone? Not to me. No, it doesn't. Because we know, and, and we discussed the, two, the 1260, dealing with the treading under the, the underfoot, this, the holy city for 42 months, right? And here you have trodden underfoot, the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So obviously the trotting under the feet ends in 1798, right? Logical. Yeah. So that means that the answer to the question is to the period in where the 2300 days begins. 
right? Not to the end of it. So we know in 1798, that's going to be the time of the end. And we're going to have then uh, the Moed, right? So we've talked about this and that's why I'm bringing this up, right? And in 819, that's where it's going to say, and he said, behold, I will make thee, thee know what shall be at the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed, the end shall be. So when we talk about the time of the end, the time of the end is not really a point. It's a period of time from 1798 to 1844, correct? Okay, agreed. And we also still are in the time of the end. Ellen White's quite clear on that, that the time of the end began. It didn't just stop when it began. But we also know that in a repeat of history, we also have a time of the end uh, that's talked about in Daniel chapter 11. So in Daniel chapter 11, right, we've we focused on that, uh, particularly, where was that? I always forget. Yeah, the appointed time he shall return, right? So that's verse 29. And in verse 27, for yet at the end shall be the time appointed. Right. So we know that the end, the time of the end and the time appointed are connected. And then we take the one in verse 27, which we're going to be looking at verse 26 and 27 today, that that, that is a iteration that happens in our history. That is, it's referring to the time of the end in 1989, not the time of the end in 1798. And that's because of the word yet, which is an iteration. So we're going to, um, we're going to look at these verses. So I, I, I think. You know, one of the problems that I guess the reason I bring it up, one is because I'm always interested in why people have a weird way of thinking. And I can't communicate like we've tried communicating on all different types of things. Never can we ever come to a, any sort of like common ground in language or anything like that. It's like I'm saying it's kind of fruitless, you know, for us to have a discussion because it always ends up being about um, definitions of words which I believe, you know, should be well-defined and that we should stick to them. And and he uses all kinds of, uh, he always thinks it's something clever when he, he gives a different definition to a word than anybody else ever uses. And then, and, and then creates some new idea from that. So I, I just find when people use their own special definitions, it's pretty hard to communicate with someone. I, I grew up with my dad who was like that. And his own definitions for words. So, um, but I, I find it fascinating. But anyway, here uh, we can see then that the understanding of the prophetic periods, the understanding of the two desolating powers, the understanding of paganism and papalism are essential to understanding the 2300 days and essential to understanding Daniel chapter 11. And, and the reason why, you know, there's lots of reasons, but one of the reasons why we've had so much trouble within Adventism to understand the book of Daniel, specifically Daniel chapter 11 and the time in the end and so forth, is that we haven't understood the two desolating powers. The whole basis that Miller had for coming to the conclusion that the 2300 days ended about the year 1843, right? if he did not have the 2520. He would not have drawn that conclusion, correct? I would have to agree with that. Now, it's, it, it's intriguing that you've been, you were having this kind of a conversation yesterday. During yesterday's study, I'd received a text from a friend that has moved across country. Okay. And he had run into a party that was not being listened to very much within the church that they were attending and it turned out this other party was trying to reinterpret the 2300 days as being 1150 days because of the arab and boker and i pointed out to my friend that this was very similar to what desmond ford had been presenting and was based upon studies that he cottrell and others had done subsequent to some of this that that um, Prescott had done. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take away the understanding of the day for a year, and you take away 
2,300 evening and morning as being a prophetic statement and try to interpret it, interpret this as a literal statement. Mm -hmm. Again, you remove the very basis of the Advent message. Yeah. Now, now we dealt with that a little bit in um, studying E.J. Wagner's uh, deathbed confession there. His, uh, right. Confession, as he called it. So, so that undermining had happened early on in, uh, in the time, in, in the early on in the beginning of the 1900s. So the 20th century there with, with, especially once Ellen White had passed away, it, it became, you know, au courant, um, to have these different sort of views on prophecy. But somehow, you know, the 2300 days was just, um, an uneducated, interpretation of Daniel chapter eight. And and people always keep thinking that, you know, you know, and I get accused of this, you know, novelty. The, the novelty somehow, people have this belief that novelty is a sign of genius. Wow. Right? You, you understand what I'm saying, right? Yes, I get it. <laughs> and now an interesting thing, just this is a bit of a digression, but can um, can you uh, can you restate that? Yeah, I'm going to explain it. So uh, novelty is just something new, right? So um, a new interpretation of something, there's people all the time that they're trying to find a new interp they're, they're trying to find new light or a new interpretation. Or to, and in a sense, kind of what we're doing, we're looking for hidden treasure. We're looking for things that haven't been found before. But everything that we find must support what's been established. It's never meant to overturn something that we believe, right? Like we're, 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 we're investigating, we're looking at the evidence that's there. And if what we have is true, then the evidence will support, you know, our previous conclusions. And that's what we found. But sometimes people think that if they find something that counteracts what we used to believe, then that's somehow an amazing thing. Right. So if we can find some new interpretation that undermines the foundation, then that's a sign of genius. Right. That's that's how many people approach new light. And, and we see this with all these different winds of doctrine, whether it's the anti Trinitarian movement or uh, lunar Sabbatarians or feast days. And, and there's a multitude within all of these groups that. It's about finding out something that the other group doesn't agree with. It, it's actually a way of, of separating yourselves from others, right? And this movement has not been immune to that idea, to that effect. It is, and sometimes, you know, I've been accused of that when I would find some of the things dealing with the, you know, like Ezra 7 to 10, and, and I find these chiasms in there. And people would wonder, why do you always come up with all of this sensational stuff? Well, I'm not looking for sensational stuff. I'm just looking to understand Adventism. But I don't come up with things that say what we used to believe was wrong because I found this, right? So like somebody taking the 2300 days and saying, well, it's actually 1150 days. I mean, that completely undermines Adventism. Well, it, here's the other part of it. Not only does it undermine Adventism, but if we set that aside for a moment, yeah, it undermines the gospel. Well, yeah. Because how can 490 years be allotted to the Jewish people? If they are actually 245 days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there's all kinds of problems. Now, the, the thing that I was going to say, too, in, in the world of academia, of scholarship, if you're going to write a Ph.D., you have to have a unique thesis, right? That is, right. you have to come up with something novel. And uh, when I was in university, I, I read uh, I did a book report on a book. And it was a course I took on um, uh, the gods of the the, uh, the ancient Near East. So it's all those pagan gods. It was a book about that. 
And uh, the guy was saying that the best way to understand the gods of the pagan, you know, the pagan gods of, of the Middle East is um, by seeing them as a bureaucracy, as a representation of a bureauc- bureaucracy, not the family uh, structure, but a bureaucratic structure. And, and, and the paper was, was in a sense, or the book, because it ends up being a book that was published, but it was his doctoral dissertation. Um, it ended up being basically almost a satire of a doctoral uh, dissertation in that the whole, the whole premise that he had, uh, he, he basically showed that the idea was wrong. <laughs> but, and it's hard to explain, but he was, he was, coming up with something novel because he had to but in the end it didn't make any sense and and he sort of almost is defeated at the end of his doctoral dissertation it was it was quite humorous and i don't know if it was intentionally satire in that sense that he realized how ridiculous it was or it's just you know like when he started or if it just came uh, to be the result at the end but so he had this thesis which he couldn't really support and, and sort of had to admit it, but not, not too directly. It, it, it was very strange, but anyway, um, so I pointed this out in my, my book review and, and uh, the professor thought it, thought it was pretty hilarious that I noticed this because he, he, he was pretty certain that that was the case, that the guy had a, a thesis that didn't, that he couldn't support by reality. But but often this is what happens within um, within Adventism, within the study of the Bible, and you'll you'll find all kinds of people who come up with some new idea. Now, in what we have done, have is our focus been on coming up with some new idea, like novelty for novelty's sake? I don't see that we've been trying to come up with something novel for novelty's sake in this. Yeah, I can't see it. I mean. What, everything that we do, we do notice things that other people have never noticed, but they always make everything that we believed in the past uh, clearer. You know, we have a, a really strong uh, narrative understanding of Daniel 10 to 12 that, that, that pulls it all together with the other parts of the book of Daniel. Understanding that Daniel chapter 11, for instance, is really a commentary on Daniel 7, 8, and 9, and, and probably chapter 2 as well, right? But but especially uh, chapter 9, uh, dealing with the 70 weeks, because even though he has an understanding of it, it, it's filling in detail, but it's not just filling in detail out of context. The context um, is extremely important, and the fact that we can connect within Daniel chapter 11 prior to verse 40 to see that 1798 and 1989 are already directly mentioned makes a lot of sense. And if we didn't have that understanding of Daniel chapter 40, I mean, 40 to 45, we couldn't even really begin to understand the beginning of Daniel chapter 11, right? We we wouldn't, we wouldn't even understand what Daniel 11 is about. We need to understand the times of the end. We need to understand the prophetic periods. We need to understand the two desolating powers. Or definitely, we have to understand what the daily and the transgression of desolation are. And, and the connection of the 2300 days to the end of those periods, that 45-year period and 46-year period, that occur in connection with the time of the end in 1798. And then also the time of the end in, in our time that this repeat of history is built into Daniel chapter 11. So then when we're looking at the present truth application, what is the basis for that? So we've been doing that. We've been looking at this present truth application. But why can we do this? What is it about Daniel chapter 11 that tells us we can do this? I mean, we are putting line upon line, right? We've got this from other places. But when we're putting in this present truth application to our history, why can we do that? What's what's the biblical idea in Daniel chapter 11 that allows us to do that? That God shows the end from what happened at the beginning. Okay, so the, we have the end from the beginning. So 
So what we have in Daniel chapter 11 is we have a history of, you know, Persia, right? Then we have a history of Greece, and then we have a history of pagan Rome, and then we have a history of papal Rome. And that history is going to bring us all the way up to Millerite history. And we can see that there is a parallel that exists within each of these lines themselves. That is, that they're dealing with different aspects that these, and, and one way to look at it. So we know that um, da- the prophecies of Daniel, the book of Daniel, are, we have Daniel chapter 2. That's a prophecy that lays out a, a parallel to the first seven times, the pride of your power, the kingship. Daniel chapter 2, the image is about the kingship, the power, right? The kingdoms. You're right. right? So, okay. And then Daniel chapter 7 is about uh, the wild beasts, right? The beasts. Yeah. And we know the second seven times is, you know, that wild beasts shall rob you of your children, right? That's going to be the aspect of these kingdoms that is like wild beasts. It has to do with the persecutory power of these these animals, right? There's lots of other things about it, but but these are, are animals that, you know, do destructive damage, right? You got, you know, a lion, a bear, you know, a leopard, and then some kind of strange beast that, you know, nobody's ever seen, right? A dragon. Right. So you've got these these different these different beasts. And that's, of course, wild beasts shall rob you of your children. Daniel's taken captive under the second seven times. OK, so that's the captivity. And then Daniel chapter eight is about how that that's going to be dealing with sanctuary symbolism. Right. Even though it's pagan sanctuaries. But, you know, you have sanctuary type animals, even though they're deformed. A ram with, you know, uh, a disproportionate horns, right? Wouldn't be fit for sacrifice in the, in the Jewish temple. And then you have a goat with, with one horn that's going to break into four horns. And it's almost, it's almost a flying goat at that. Yeah. So again, you know, these are sac- sanctuary type animals, but they're perverted, right? So this is the counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary. And so the third times deals with uh, with the with the sanctuary being destroyed, right? So it addresses that, it, and and the siege as well, right? So it, it's dealing with what's going to happen under the third seven times that is Jehoiachin's captivity, and then in the fourth seven times, all of those things are repeated. In Daniel chapter uh, eleven, it's going to take what has happened before in the different visions the different prophecies, and it's going to combine them, right? That is, we're going to see all of these different characteristics of these powers. And we're going to see in Rome, of course, Rome is, is the fourth kingdom, and it's going to, it's going to have all of these characteristics um, magnified or amplified that, is, that Rome has all the characteristics of Babylon. It has all the characteristics of Medo-Persia. And it has all the characteristics of Greece. And that's that's historically true. So that means that built into these prophecies is these ideas of these parallel histories. Now, then it also gives us a time of the end in 1798 and an iteration of the time of the end in 1989. That is, it points forward to uh, the Sunday law. So that means the end of the prophetic periods, the time of the end. 1798 to 1844 are going to typify our history that's built into it. And so when we go back over Daniel chapter 11 and we see the parallel between the kings of Persia and the presidents of the United States, it's not some something that we're forcing upon the text as some sort of parallel just because, well, things in the Old Testament, you know, these stories, we can find parallels in our history. It's actually more than just implicit in the text. In a sense, it's explicit in the text 
because the past the, when you go through Daniel chapter 11, it's really telling you that you can look at the beginning of Daniel chapter 11 to understand the end because it keeps paralleling these these symbols, the king of the north, the king of the south, and all of these other symbols that we see in, in Daniel chapter 11. They're there at the end of the world. And so they're meant to be understood in this present truth application as we are looking at it, right? Now, it is true that sometimes when we're looking at these things, there are details that become a little more um, zoomed in than others. That is, they, they show things about our movement itself, but it doesn't take away from the fact that if we just zoom out a little bit, we see, you know, the United States, the Soviet Union, the papacy, the main players in prophecy clearly marked out. Now, when we zoom in, we might see things about the movement itself. Um, but that's not, the, that's, that's, that's sort of just a reality of when you have a way mark and you zoom in, you're going to have another line. But this, so this line here, what we see here in verse 25 and 26 is not just an application that we've made of that history. It is the present truth application of that history. Even if we could, we could make another application. This is the application. Does that make sense to people? It's logical. Okay. So we're going to look at uh, verses 27 and 28 here. And, and we've partly started to, to look at the present truth application. Now, we, he says both these kings, um, that's Octavian and Antony. Now, I put in here that that's the USA and the UN. So Octavian. Now, remember, in the one above, we just said pagan Rome under Octavian. And that's going to be the United States and the papacy as the king of the north. So they're they're united. And what we see in verse 25 and 26 is is a history that in verse 27 and 28 is going to be expanded on. Right. That is. It talks about what happens with uh, the fall of Egypt and the Battle of Actium, which is responding to what was mentioned earlier. But now it's going to go back at the end of that line. And it's going to it's going to talk about this alliance that occurred between Octavian and Antony. Right. So so they had an alliance. Now, there was also um, in the triumvirate. Who who is the other one that was aligned with them? Uh with the death of um, Julius Caesar, what was his name again? Well, okay, you you got in the first triumvirate, you had Pompey, Caesar, and Crassius. Okay, and, and then this is and Octavian, Antony, and who? Uh, Lepidius, wasn't it? Okay, Lepidius. Okay, yeah, or Lepidus, however you say his name. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Now, now he's not mentioned here in this context um, because it's just going to talk about this this battle between Octavian and Antony, and it's going to go back and it's going to say, "But will both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table." So, these two kings—that is, the king of the north and the king of the south—we can see in our history the king of the north, which is the United States and the papacy here in this context is the United States and the UN and that we're marking this at 9-11 when they're going to have this alliance that occurs. We, we mark within the Adventist church spiritual formation, uh, but we also have this um, Patriot Act. So the Patriot Act uh forms an alliance with the United Nations. Now, why does, why do we say that? So this is, so we look at 1989 is in connection with the United States, you know, holding hands with the papacy. Yeah. And now it's going to hold hands with, you know, the dragon power, the UN. Why do we mark that at 9-11? I mean, the UN has been around for a long time. You know, the United States is in, in New York is where they have the UN building headquarters there. But why do we mark 9-11? Really, it's, it's the only time in collective memory 
that America was attacked on its on its home territory. Okay. Well, it was attacked at uh, you know February twenty sixth, uh, nineteen ninety three. Not quite the same way. Yeah. Well, the building didn't fall over, but it could have. You know, if they parked thirty meters over, you know, it's like thirty two yards. Uh, you know, the the North Tower would have fallen into the South Tower. I believe. Did, well. did we did we mark that for uh, Revelation eighteen being coming in? Revelation okay. Well, Mark, I mean, yeah, Revelation 18. But that's not why we, we are marking the UN uh, there. So we know it, it, in a sense, is the beginning of the Sunday law. 9-11 is. I mean, in a sense, our whole history is the history of the Sunday law from 1989 to the Sunday law. But 9-11 specifically because the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down there. But there is an alliance that's that's being talked about here at 9-11 so, yes, we have the attack on the World Trade Center, but it's the response to the attack that really marks this alliance. And, you know, there's probably a lot more behind the scenes than we know. I'm pretty sure, you know, even conspiracy theorists can't can't figure out what's really happening behind the scenes. But one of the things that we believe about 9-11 is that a Sunday law was in the works and that 9-11, when it came along, it actually... Uh, disrupted plans that were in place already, right? That's that's what we have taught in this movement. Jeff clearly taught that, okay? We, we all agree with that? Now, I don't think that that Sunday law could have, could have worked, even if they were planning a Sunday law in the 1990s, because you have to have an environment in which the population is willing to have a Sunday law the vast majority of the population. And the religious right would would have to convince the left, right? So at some point we, you know, events had to unfold in a way that is going to change the structure of the world. And 9-11 definitely changed the structure of the world. We had a world before 9-11 and a world after 9-11, and they're extremely different. Young people have no idea how much the world changed because of 9-11. You know, a lot of times we could say, well, there's technology that occurred and there's lots of different things that occurred. But without 9-11, you don't have the drastic change um, that we see in the world today. So 9-11, because of the Patriot Act, it's connecting the United States to the UN. In, In a sense, the United States... Why do they seek this alliance? What is it that the United States, what's the problem with the United States when they get attacked by Islamic terrorists at 9-11? What's the problem that Americans see that they're trying to solve? It's a pretty simple answer. I'm not understanding right yet. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm trying to ask the question in a way that I don't get the answer. Okay. okay. So, so the United States is... This superpower that has has created a global economy, right? Correct. And Islam is an unstabilizing force to that economy. I would agree. And uh, with 9-11, Americans sort of woke up to the reality that um, their security, the false sense of security that Americans had, especially after the end of the Cold War, right? So you're going to be going through, like, the 1990s with um, this sense that, you know, the Americans won the Cold War and and basically all conflict is over, right? All right. But, but 9-11 wakes up Americans to a new threat, right? Now, sure, Islamic terrorists have been around. They were around in the 70s, right, and been around for a long time, but, you know, started making news a little bit more in the 70s. I mean, obviously, we had China as a threat and things like that. But to have this attack on on the United States so directly and so devastatingly and, and so symbolically that the reaction that Americans had was irrational. It, it never made sense to me to bring in the TSA because of 9-11, to bring in all of this security, 
to me, that was like admitting defeat. I mean, the best thing you could do is just ignore it. Um, obviously, you know, you, there's security that you can do, but you you never can stop terrorist attacks, right? Well, I mean, you, right? I mean, you, you, I don't even know if you, they they could mitigate them. Get okay, what? What's that? The way that this was approached within America was the antithesis of how this was approached in Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Israel, you deal with the threat of terror attacks on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And their situation and security, especially at their airports, is 180% or 180 degrees different than what they're doing in the U.S. Well, what is the cost? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, if you think about what that cost to provide this false sense of security, because it is a false sense of security, it's not real security, after after 9-11, I mean, the costs are astronomical. It The economic cost to the United States is, is dis, disproportionate to the actual threat. But it also is added an additional layer of government control. Well, yeah, and and the amount of control, the freedom that's taken away, um, you know, it, if you're in danger, I mean, you could say being locked in a prison is safer than being in in connection with that danger, but the prison is is just as much a danger as being outside the prison, right? You know, to to trade freedom or for safety isn't very safe. But but that's the way things happened. So anyway, you know, we kind of digress a little bit, but we can see that, that what ends up happening is this union, this alliance with the UN is something that is intended to enslave Americans. Because of 9-11, the United States changed the way in which they were operating, even though they were operating that way before, but at least the way that they could outwardly operate in controlling their citizens. Right. What happened with the pandemic is the result of 9-11. Without 9-11, you could have never had what happened in 2020. Correct. I would agree, because what what happened with 9-11, it's not it's not so much the enslavement, but mm -hmm. it is that Americans were being herded. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, they're herded like animals. Exactly. To to the slaughter sort of thing. Yeah. Now, so just an interesting uh, thing that I noticed this morning. So you'll see I have a footnote there with the Hebrew number seven, 7979, right? So when we mark this, this alliance, we're marking 911, and it says they shall speak lies at one table. So I looked up to the word table, 7979, and um and I said, well, if we're going to count that many days from 9-11, where are we going to end up? And so when I do that, I end up at July 17th, 2023. Now, you might be able to see the footnote down there at the bottom. It's, it's you know, footnotes right. are smaller. Uh, but July 17th, 2023, that's, you know, past. But it's uh, it was a date in which they had... Uh, the HESI Global Forum um, at the UN headquarters. So the Global Forum, which was held on the 17th of July, 2023, as an in-person event at the United Nations headquarters, placed a particular focus on understanding the challenges and opportunities to accelerate the recovery from COVID-19 and the full impl implementation of the 2030 agenda at all levels in line with the theme of the HLPF in 2023. Now, I put a link there on the paper uh, to the site where they talk about this. Um, and, and I'm basically just quoting what they say on their site. I, I changed it from future tense to past tense, but it's, it's basically word for word. So we can see that this global agenda, this 2030 agenda is connected with these lies that were spoken at one table. Does, does that make sense? Am I making a leap here? 
in connecting that to that event. So you count from September 11, 2001, 7,979 7, days, and it brings you to that event, the date of that event. It's an intriguing premise. Yeah. And then I look at the word one, so Ichad, and that's 259. So I just counted 259 days from that July 17th, 2023 date. And that's going to bring us to uh, my favorite day of the year, uh, April 1st, 2024. Okay. That's that's uh, the atheist uh, day, right? April Fools, you know, a fool shall say in his heart, there is no God. Right. So, so we know that the UN is, it's, so I take April 1st as a symbol of atheism. Maybe that's just my own personal take on it. But uh, so I think it's interesting that one table, if we take those two Hebrew numbers, we count from September 11th, 2001, it brings us to April 1st, 2024. And of course, uh, that's not many days hence, right? That's what, uh, 12 days away, right? Yeah. So so I, I thought that was interesting as well. I didn't put the, that in as the footnote. I, I guess I could add it. Could add it under under this two five nine. Some people get uh, offended when I call it atheist day. Get brackets within brackets. I guess that's allowed. Does that make sense? So that that I think that one thing we can we can see with this this symbol, this lies at one table, that it points us to the work of the UN. And to 2030, right? So we remember 2030, this 2030 agenda. We connect it to April 5th, 2030 as a symbol. Everybody understands that? Now it says, um, so we have these false alliances. We can see that they're connected to the UN. And these alliances are pointed to an agenda, which is a United Nations agenda, which is the World Health Off, World Economic Forum's uh, agenda, this 2030 agenda. Which at the present time is that's where they're where they're marking. They got all these goals for 2030, which of course will never be accomplished because they're uh, not good at, at actually doing things. And they also they they can never anticipate the reaction of humans to their wonderful plans. But it it shall not prosper. So these gre- agreements would not al- would not last. So what specifically? Um, what, what specifically should we be looking for when they shall not prosper? What, if we don't, I mean, we know that these aren't agreements aren't, wouldn't last because they're going to turn against each other, right? Octavian and, and Antony. But what would that be pointing to in our history? Now, now the world, we're, okay, what's that? that? There would be no economic benefit. Okay. So they're not going to prosper. So we have, uh, I'm just going to look this up here. Six, seven, I didn't look it up yet. Six, seven, four, three. I'm just going to see if this connects in any way with what our history is. Okay. So, well, that's interesting. So if, if we take the word prosper and we count it from 9-11, and I'm just going to do check this again, make sure I did that right. Okay. Okay. So if I count from September 11th, Six, seven, four, three. That's the number I have there. Making sure I got the number typed in right. Six, seven, four, three. Okay, so that brings us to um, the end of February in 2020. Now, what what's the date that they declare the pandemic in the United States? Does anybody anybody know? I know it's it's around February 20 something. This one brings us to 26 or 27, whether we count uh, uh, inclusive or or cardinal. I thought they first discovered it in the winter time. Yeah, I know, but they're they're going to declare it. You know, it's going to be at the end end of February, I believe, that they start to. I mean, there is a timeline of this. It was um, declared as an international concern on the 30th of January. Yeah, and they declared it as a pandemic on the 11th of March. Okay, so the 11th of March is going to be the pandemic declaration. Okay, 
So that brings us anyway into that time period. Um, let me see. Because I was just reading something the other day about this date. Okay. Yeah, see, I think it has more to do with Canada than with the United States. Anyway, it puts us into that timeline. Um, into this time where we have this uh, pandemic beginning. I know, you know, for me, I usually mark March 27th. So anyway, it's just uh, an observation there that um, we have this uh, shall not prosper. So six, seven, four, three. So I just, so that's going to bring us to February 27th, if that means anything. So I'd have to, I'd have to look up more on that and what specifically happens on that day. But anyway, what it does is it connects that um, the pandemic to 9-11, the history of the pandemic. Now, lots of numbers could do that, right? So it's not like a specific date that we have. Uh, you know, if it had gone to March 11th, that would be better, right, as far as establishing that. And then it says, for yet, the end shall be at the time appointed. Now, we mark the time appointed as the end of the prophetic periods, right? So that's going to be 1798 in, in that history. Or is this 1989 that we're marking here? Yes, this is going to be for yet. So yet is an iteration. The end, that's the time of the end, shall be at the time appointed, the Moad. So so in this one, we would connect this to 1798 to 1844 is what we should have. So I would have put here, I don't know why I didn't do it that way. Right. So what we're going to have here is the end, the extremity, which is 1798. And the time appointed, the end of the prophetic periods, um, October 22, 1844. And probably this one I could put at 1798. Now, we're saying that October 22 represents the Sunday law. So that's that's verse 27. Uh, anything else we should put in there? I mean, I'm, I'm just going to put so that this symbolizes these agreements that won't last has to do with the pandemic. So the pandemic symbolizes these agreements that won't last in that history. So the pandemic's connected to this this initiative of 2030. Any, any other thoughts on what we have here? So we can see, it, even as this history is going back, so I just want to clarify this. So we have this, this battle of Actium, right? The defeat of Egypt. And then it's going to go back in that history of Octavian and Anthony. But here, it's going to just give more details about 9-11 and its connection to our history, right? So... It's going to bring us to the time of the end. It's going to bring us to the Sunday law because it's telling us that what's happening with this, uh, these, this history of Octavian and Antony, uh, that's going to end, you know, it's, it's going to end, right? That's going to be the battle of Actium. So, so maybe what we should, um, would last and we need to mark here the battle of Actium. Now, then can we connect this pandemic? with something that would parallel the battle of acting. Does that make sense? Please repeat your question. Okay, so so we're saying that that this alliance does not prosper, right? And that is these agreements wouldn't last as per Actium, right? So Actium is showing that these agreements would not last. We're gonna have the battle of Actium, they're gonna have that battle. And we're saying that there is agreements that were made at 9-11 that in connection with the pa pandemic uh, is illustrating that these agreements would not last. Now, we would say, well, the pandemic appears to be a strengthening of these agreements, right? Right. Okay. So, so how do we address that then? Maybe what we can look at is, is, is uh, not prosper. So if I take that whole phrase not prosper, I think that that brings us to a better date uh, that connects us. So I'm going to show you here. So we get, okay, so we're going to go to September 11th, 
2001. Okay, and we're going to count, um, what was it, 6743, I believe, okay. brings us February 27th, and not 3808 brings us to August 1st, 2030, which is the first day of the fifth month. Does that, so that brings us to 2030, which is this year in which, you know, this whole, this whole thing is pointing because of this, this agenda. And it's going to bring us to the first day of the fifth month on the biblical calendar, first day of the eighth month on our calendar. Does that make sense? That the, what it's pointing to as a symbol, we're just taking 2030 as a symbol. We're not predicting an event in 2030, but as a symbol, the first day of the fifth month in 2030, we, we already have uh, the 10th day of this, the seventh month marked in 2030, October 8th. And we already have the first day of the first month marked in 2030, April 5th. But this now marks the first day of the fifth month. So does this point to the end of of that alliance not prospering, just as a symbol? Because that's what the alliance is about, the agenda of the 2030 agenda. Does, does that make sense? Or am I not explaining it well? It can be difficult to see, but no, it, it, it's pointing that way. Yes. So we're going to say that these agreements shall not prosper. And I'm just going to put the footnote here. So we take, um, uh, H3808 plus H6743. And that's going to equal, and hopefully I did this all correct. Pretty sure I did. So you add those together, you get 10,551, which is 28 years and 324 days. So that makes sense. It's almost 29 years. Yep. Yeah. Should do it the other way. So I got this done here. Just put this footnote in at the bottom. So H3808 plus H6743 equals 10,551 days, which is, I didn't put the number of years, but it's 28 years, 324 days. And, and that goes from 9-11 to August 1st, 2030, which is the first day of the fifth month in 2030. So this connects to this 2030 agenda. So as a symbol, this 2030 is a symbol of this Alliance between the United States and the UN. And as a symbol, this points to an end of the prospering of that alliance. So whatever that means. So in, in, so what we'll just say is the end of the 2030 agenda, which is what it's called. Okay. Makes sense. Any thoughts on that? Just no, I mean it it looks right. Yeah, so what, what it's showing is that what has happened with the fall of the Soviet Union, right, which is typified uh in that history of uh the Battle of Actium, right? We're now gonna have this alliance with Octavian and Antony and its failure as going from nine eleven to twenty thirty. This is, this is the time in which, and again, 2030 is not pointing to the date 2030 as an actual date. It's just a symbol of something. And that symbol is the 2030 agenda symbol, something that comes from the World Economic Forum that has been embraced, obviously, by the United Nations, right? Okay. All these unelected people just uh, telling us what, what should happen, what we should do, how to live our lives, and so forth. And, and then what it says is for yet uh, the end shall be at the time appointed. Now that time appointed is 1798 or the end is 1798 to 1980 to October 22, 1844. That's the, the time of the end to the time appointed. That's Millerite history. And it's telling us that that history will be repeated. And is that history repeated in this what has been happening since 1989 to 911? Right. Yes. Right. So we can see that, that that's built right in this interpretation in red 
of the historical parallel is being stated plainly at the end of verse uh, 26 there. Is that, or is that the beginning of verse 27? No, that's the end of verse 26. No, it's, it's the, it's the end of verse 27. Okay. And then, and then we're going to have, um, verse 28. So then it says, then shall the king of the north return to his land with great riches. So, so we didn't really fill in exactly how that parallels our history yet. And his heart shall be against the holy covenant. He shall do and return to his own land. So it's going to have him uh, returning to his own land and returning to his own land. So we say that originally this is going to be about the Battle of Actium and what happens after that. And then it's going to be about the persecution of Christians by pagan Rome. And in both cases, uh, the king of the north is going to con conquer the UN and he's going to uh, persecute Christianity. And, and so this is still pagan Rome. But then it says, at the time appointed, now we're saying that this time appointed is not the time appointed above, that's 1798. This is the one that's the iteration of it, so that it actually points to the time of the end of 1989. He, that is the papacy, and the USA, the king of the north, in that history, that's who it is, right? It's going to be the papacy. Shall return and come toward the south. But it shall not be as the former, the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, or as the latter, the fall of Western Rome. So that's that's what we're saying. We're saying that, that this is a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, where the king of the north is going to conquer the king of the south. That's 1989. And the way it's not like the latter, or, or the way that it's not like the former, um, is that it's it's going to be not the literal king of the north and the literal king of the south. You get exploit crossed off there. Yeah, just because I, I just don't think that word should be there. It's not in the Hebrew. He just sh he shall do right. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, exploits is just you know they just added a word there to kind of make it better English, but exploits yeah. doesn't really mean anything, right? He's gonna do exploits. He's gonna do things, right? So. It's just kind of a misleading word in modern English. So, and, and then as the latter, that is, it's going to be the fall. Um, so there, that's going to be fall, the fall of Western Rome. That's going to be the latter, the fall of Western Rome. And the characteristic um, has to do with the fact, and we didn't write that in here, but that the papacy is not going to be doing this directly, just as Rome did this directly, or, or pardon me, this happened to Rome by these Germanic tribes, right? So, um, so the way that it's not like the latter, and I always forget how we put that. It's not like the latter. I'm trying to remember. Let me look up yesterday. We discussed it yesterday. I always forget. I'll, I'll remember it one day. Anybody remember how it's not like the latter? It's not like the former. And it's not like the latter. We discussed that yesterday. It was like the day before. With the Pope in behind it. Yeah, it has something to do with the Pope, but there's a way that I described it. Um, because the United States is going to be the power that um, brings this about. See, I mean, back in the 1990s, everybody was, you know, focused a lot on the papacy. We've always been focused on what is the Pope doing? But it's really more important to understand what's happening in the United States. And we always will look at, well, how is the Pope, you know, connected to the United States? And I'm not saying that that's not important, but I'm saying these actions are going to be done by the United States, not by the papacy directly. So... Um, doing things more stealth stealthily than they used to. So I put here, the latter is the, is the start on November 9th, 1989. The former is going to address 1798. Uh, cause the latter has the ships of Kittim coming in. They caused the fall of Western Rome. Fall is going to be the fall of Western Rome, which is we're going to look at in verse 30. The latter also we have this former and the latter tied together in verse 29. So it's the United States that's going to bring in the Sunday law, not the papacy. 
there was another thing um because the United States is acting as the armies of Rome. Rome isn't using its own armies. Now, there's still something I'm, I'm missing here in, in this understanding this. I'll figure it out at some point, or we will. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, we have the time of the end of 1989. That's going to be um, this repeat of this history. But it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So the fall of Western Rome... So we have from 410 to 476, and the power that comes in and brings about the fall of Rome is not the papacy directly. The papacy is using, not that it's intentionally doing this, right, because the papacy isn't behind the scenes making uh, Western Rome fall. But in God's providence, it's it's not going to be the papacy that is Pagan Rome has to be taken out of the way so that paper Rome can be set upon the throne of the earth. And that, oh, that's what it was. Now I remember. So when we deal with the fall of the Soviet Union, we had a discuss, discussion regarding the fall of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is going to destroy itself, right? Like obviously we know we have um, the papacy and the United States working together with this economic and military um, pressure. So, so, so this makes sense, correct? What I'm, what I'm saying, even though I'm not explaining it well. So I guess the question is, how is it not as the latter, the fall of Western Rome? So there's some parallels. So what, what's the main difference? I still don't think we've, we've, we've nailed it down in a way that's simple enough to understand. No, we haven't. Yeah. So we have to, we have to somehow express that because it is about the fall of Western Rome. But it's because it parallels it. So the fall of Western Rome parallels the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, the fall of the Soviet Union, in this case, is the king of the south. So that's similar to what happens in 1798 in that, or, or in 1989, because you have the king of the south. But it's not the literal king of the south. So it's a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. Right. So that that's the parallel in 1989. But the way it's not like the fall of Western Rome is what way is it not like the fall of Western Rome? So we we can say it's like the fall of Western Rome, but here the papacy is not going to be set upon the throne of the earth in 1989, right? The papacy is there, but, you know, in some ways you could say it's it's, um, with the fall of Western Rome, you're going to have these pagan powers come in. Germanic tribes come in. They're going to cause the fall of Western Rome. It has something more to do with the way that they're disguised. You know, Rome works more behind the scenes now than we're used to, according to... Yeah, they're more behind the scenes. That's a difference. But but there's a lot of similarities. But there, there must be something more specific in how it's not as the latter. I mean, we could, we could argue, we could just say, well, they're both, you know, dealing with, with, uh, not literal things, right? We're not dealing with the literal king of the north and the king of the south, and that's true as well, right? So that would be as the former, the king of the north and the king of the south. We don't really have a king of the north and the king of the south uh, with the fall of Western Rome, per se, right? Though you're still going to have the papacy as the king of the north, but they're not defeating the king of the south. So I, I don't know if I have a... I don't have a clear, concise, straightforward answer to that. It's just kind of a roundabout that this has to do with the fall of Western Rome parallels what happens in 1989. Just as the Battle of Actium typifies that, King of the North defeating the King of the South. There's something about the Germanic tribes coming in and conquering Rome that has to do with the fall of Western Rome. That is... We know that they they hired this military these mercenaries from the Germanic tribes instead of having Roman citizens being in the in the military, which they had in the early history. As they move into the you know the first century, second century, as time goes on, the army is eventually composed almost entirely of people from the Germanic nations, uh, commanded by uh, you know Roman citizens. But, you know, the fighting power is is then going to turn against them. 
So, so there's some, so that, that parallel is there in the fall of the Soviet Union. So the question is, what is different? Why is it not as the latter? It's not going to be as the former or as the latter. And, and that, I don't think we've defined that, what that is. Okay. So I think that's a question that we're going to have to look at, uh, tomorrow and, and try to really think about exactly how that parallel is the same, but different. But I think verse 27 and 28, um, we, we got a few things to finish up there. But I think tying this to, especially this first part, to this 2030 agenda with those spans of time, I think are important. So the first one gives it just by connecting us to first to that symbol of that conference or whatever it's called, um, forum on July 17th last year and then to April 1st this year and then uh, not prospering connecting us to the first day of the fifth month in 2030 as a symbol there marking the end of the 2030 agenda and then you know 1798 time of the end to the Sunday law that's what's being typified there it's just saying for that history is going to be repeated so what happens in 1798 to 1844 is going to re be repeated in our history. And then that's this, this verse 28. I still think we need a bit more work on it to understand it better. Okay. Well, let's close in prayer. Well, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. We just pray for your presence um, through the rest of the day and that you can bring us together tomorrow to study your word once again, and to understand these things. We pray for one another. Uh, you know the trials that we face, the difficulties, the challenges, the temptations, and you know uh, the struggle that we have with self. We just pray, Lord, that we can manifest your character. We pray that your angels can watch over each one and that we can trust in you in all things. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.